Faith can be an incredible thing. For some people, it's the only thing that gets them through their day, while for others, it serves as a source of renewal and inspiration. But it can also be a very dangerous thing when faith is placed in the wrong person. Those of us who grew up in the church will know that ministers, elders, and deacons are held in high regard in their respective church families, since they're seen as the leaders of the church and are tasked with helping and guiding their congregation. But some of those who call themselves ministers of God, they're not at all what they seem. Matt Baker served as a Baptist minister at the Crossroads Baptist Church in Hewitt, Texas back in 2006. He and his wife Carrie were well known in their community, and from the outside, their marriage seemed perfect. The couple met while they were both still students at Baylor University in Waco, and they immediately hit it off. Just three months later, they would tie the knot at Carrie's parents' house, and following this, Matt would attend the George W. Truett Theological Seminary at Baylor University, where he completed his studies to become a pastor. The future looked bright for the young couple, since they were both active in the church and had found happiness in each other. That joy would only grow when they had three daughters, Kinsey, Cassidy, and Grace. But things would take a tragic turn when Cassidy was diagnosed with a brain tumor in 1998. Once the tumor was found, she started receiving treatment that at first seemed promising, and she was released from the hospital. But in March of the following year, Matt found her unresponsive in her bedroom and realized she'd sadly passed away. And this understandably brought Carrie's world crashing down around her. Due to the effect that the tragedy had on her, Carrie started attending counseling sessions and would often remember her daughter by writing passages about her in her Bible. This, along with her faith and her two other daughters, kept her going during a time that many people would have found too hard to endure. But no one could have foreseen the events that were about to unfold in the family's household. It all started with a 911 call that Matt made a few minutes past midnight on the 8th of April, 2006. Matt told the operator that he left the house to get a movie and to put gas in his car. But when he returned, he was shocked to find Carrie lying lifeless on their bed with a note and an empty bottle of sleeping tablets next to her. The note read, quote, Matt, I'm so sorry. I'm so tired. I just want to sleep for a while. Please forgive me. Tell Kenzie and Grace that I love them very much. Please continue to be a great dad for our little girls. Love them every day for me. I'm sorry. I love you, Carrie. He told the operator that he had tried to revive his wife, and when he realized that she wasn't breathing, and since she wasn't clothed, he started trying to dress her one hand at a time while speaking to 911 on the phone, which he had trapped between his ear and one of his shoulders. The operator then instructed him to start administering CPR, which he did, and when EMS arrived, they took over. But Carrie was pronounced deceased when they were unsuccessful. Matt then supplied investigators with the details of what had happened that night. He stated that he left the house at around 11.10 p.m. because he wanted to rent a movie, and while he was out, he decided that he might as well get gas for the car. He was surprised when, upon his return, he found his and Carrie's bedroom door locked, and she wouldn't answer when he knocked. He became concerned that something was wrong and grabbed a screwdriver, and he was able to lever the door open, and the door lock finally popped and he stepped inside. He found Carrie lying on the bed with her arms outstretched. He then managed to dress her in a t-shirt and underwear while speaking to the 911 operator. To everyone at the scene, it seemed that Cassidy's passing had just been too much for Carrie, something that most parents would never judge her for. Jim and Linda Doolin, Carrie's mother and father, were informed of what had happened and they raced over to the house in disbelief. They knew that Carrie had been struggling, but never imagined that she would take her own life. But it wouldn't take long for their suspicions to be roused when Linda was told by her three sisters that Matt wasn't as clean cut as he pretended to be. They knew of multiple women who Matt had made advances towards while serving as their minister, but they decided not to say anything since they didn't want to cause trouble in his and Carrie's marriage. Since she was still in disbelief over the ruling that Carrie had ended her own life, she decided to do some investigating, starting with Matt and Carrie's cell phones that had just been added to her and Jim's plan. She immediately found something strange. In the weeks after Carrie had passed away, Matt had been placing calls to her number. 
In one instance, he'd called that number 17 times, and in total, he had dialed it 180 times. She then found out that the phone was no longer in Matt's possession, since he'd given it to a member of his congregation, a woman named Vanessa Bulls. Linda then contacted Bill Johnston, a former assistant district attorney and assistant U.S. attorney who, along with U.S. Marshal Mike Namera and Agent John Bennett, started their own investigation. They were able to confirm that Matt was somewhat of a ladies' man, since he'd made advances to women not only while he and Carrie were married, but also while they were dating and while he was still in college. As is often the case, things started to look even more suspicious when they checked Matt's internet history. He'd not only visited several adult websites, but more alarmingly, had performed searches for terms that alluded to taking someone's life with sleeping pills, as well as an overdose. He also researched how one would go about obtaining the sleeping pill Ambien without the need for a prescription. Everyone involved started to feel that something untoward was going on here, and the police had missed many details that pointed towards Carrie's passing being a homicide rather than her taking her own life. Through much trial and effort, Johnson was able to eventually convince the authorities that there was a need to have an autopsy conducted. And three months after that tragic night, this was finally done. And the results were interesting. Since so much time had passed, it would have been impossible to find medications in Carrie's blood. But the results showed that she had a type of sleeping medication called Unisom in her muscle tissue. This can be purchased over the counter. Ambien, the drug that Matt had researched, was also found, which was strange since Carrie was never known to have taken that particular pill. Following these findings, the ruling was changed to an undetermined cause of death. Not only were there inconsistencies as far as Carrie's passing was concerned, but there were now also rumors that Matt had been having an affair with Vanessa Bulls, to whom he'd gifted his wife's phone. Investigators realized that everything was not as it seemed, and they started suspecting that Matt may have ended Carrie's life. He was arrested in September of 2007 and charged with claiming the life of his wife, but thanks to his defense attorney, guy James Gray, he was released on bond. Gray was certain that Matt was innocent, and on one occasion told a news outlet that he only accepts cases that he has absolute faith in. He believed that it would be impossible to establish the cause of Carrie's passing, and that prosecutors would not be able to prove that this was a homicide. Linda was even more upset when she found out that the assistant district attorney had decided to drop all charges against Matt just six months later since he felt that the evidence in the case was merely speculative and that it could not be proven that a crime had been committed. But she refused to give up without a fight. She filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Matt. It would be a civil case, but she hoped that the authorities would uncover further evidence during their investigations and that they would eventually be able to build a criminal case against him. Matt had to endure a deposition, during which he would be questioned under oath. Johnston later remarked that Matt could have opted to remain silent at this point, but likely because he wanted to make it seem like he had nothing to hide, chose to answer his questions instead. He denied ever having an intimate relationship with Vanessa Bulls or anyone else while married to Carrie. But much of his testimony regarding the events of that night didn't seem to add up. He stated that while he was talking to the 911 operator, it took him mere seconds to dress his wife despite the fact that she was unresponsive and that he had to do it mostly one-handed. But Matt's defense attorney still had the upper hand. All the evidence against Matt was circumstantial and speculative at best, and unless prosecutors were able to speak to Vanessa, it seemed likely the case wouldn't go much further. When investigators interviewed her on an earlier occasion, she admitted that she and Matt had been seeing each other but insisted they only started doing so after Carrie had passed away. But she'd failed to convince Linda and the prosecution. It had come to light that Matt and Vanessa had been seen at a jewelry store in the weeks after the incident, and that they'd been looking at wedding rings. It seemed implausible that they would consider getting married if they'd only been dating for such a short time. But stranger things have happened. They also found Vanessa's demeanor to be deceitful either because she was lying or because she was withholding information that could prove detrimental to Matt's case. To get to the truth, Vanessa was ordered to testify in Matt's case, where she would come face to face with a grand jury. To ensure her full cooperation, Vanessa was told that she would not face any consequences as a result of her testimony. But she was told that if she was found to be lying under oath, 
she would be charged with perjury. When she finally appeared in court, she insisted that she had told the police the truth, but she would then suddenly make a startling confession when asked whether Matt had ever discussed that night with her. She confessed that during one of their meetings, he told her that he wanted to tell her what had happened and that he would only do it this one time. After that, it would never be discussed again. His exact words to Vanessa were, I killed her for you. When speaking with Vanessa about the crimes against Carrie, he went into further detail, telling her that he'd emptied out a few of Carrie's medication capsules and replaced their contents with Ambien. He then made sure that Carrie took them and when she started to get drowsy, he helped her to the bedroom. There, he handcuffed her to the bed and she soon drifted off. He remembered that she started snoring and this is when he enacted his plan. He kissed her on the forehead, told her to give Cassidy a hug for him, then started smothering her with the pillow. When his heinous act was complete, he uncuffed her and typed out the note that was found beside Carrie, making sure to rub it on her hands so that her fingerprints would be present. He then staged the scene and left the house to ensure that he would have an alibi. The police officers who attended the scene never thought to check Matt's computer, which they soon discovered still contained the note that he had typed, and it was never confiscated as evidence. She also revealed that Matt had sent her an MP3 file of the All-American Rejects song, Dirty Little Secret. And I think the implications are clear here. He told her to keep all of this information to herself, lest she wanted to become his next regret. It should be noted that by this point, Matt and Vanessa were no longer dating as she had already ended the relationship. Linda was elated at the news that so much information was gathered against Matt, and he was arrested once again in March of 2009. He was again charged with ending Carrie's life, but this time the prosecution would have Vanessa on their side, something that would likely not have set well with Matt. It took about four years to get to this point, but for everyone who was close to Carrie, the wait was well worth it just to see justice done. Matt continued to profess his innocence and insisted that he and Vanessa never had an affair. The court and everyone in attendance were expecting Matt and his defense attorney, Guy James Gray, to continue asserting that he never had been intimate with Vanessa. But to everyone's surprise, Gray stood up in court and proclaimed that he had been fooled by his client, who now admitted that he had cheated on his wife. He would later admit that this revelation took the wind out of his sails and that he no longer wanted to defend Matt, since it went against his policy to defend someone that he didn't have 100% confidence in. He requested to be removed from the case, but Matt insisted that he remain with his lawyer, and the court agreed. He did state that just because Matt wouldn't initially own up to the fact that he'd been unfaithful, it didn't mean that he was guilty, though the fact that he'd been lying for almost four years painted him in a less than favorable light. Instead, he focused on Carrie's depression after Cassidy passed away. He reiterated that she was using a mix of medications that included sleeping pills, and that this would have made it easy for her to end her own life. But we can't forget the fact that she was never prescribed Ambien specifically even though Ambien was found to have been in her system. Furthermore, he reminded the jury that no cause of death had been established, and hence they couldn't convict anyone of claiming her life. But luckily, Matt wasn't the only one who was aware of Carrie's state of mind. Many of her friends told investigators that although she was finding it hard to deal with her daughter's passing, she was no longer depressed. This was confirmed by her grief counselor, who had also shared another detail from the case. During her testimony, Linda told the court that the grief counselor spoke to her one day and told her that Carrie had found crushed up pills in Matt's suitcase. She also revealed that she was afraid of Matt, or rather, afraid that he was planning to harm her in one way or another. She questioned Matt about the pills, but he assured her that they didn't belong to him and that they'd likely been put in his briefcase by one of the people present at a youth center where he worked. He told her that as soon as he realized they were in his briefcase, he reported it to the youth center's security but no record of such a report was ever found. As the case continued, more and more of Matt's statements about that night just didn't seem to make sense, and it seemed as though his case was starting to fall apart. The prosecution then started focusing on his claims of what happened after he found Carrie unresponsive. They expressed their doubts about his ability to not only dress Carrie in just four minutes without any help, but also the fact that he'd performed CPR while talking to the 911 operator on his phone. He'd also stated that he found Carrie lying on her back with her arms outstretched. 
but photos from the scene prove that lividity had already set in. This term means that a deceased person's blood has started to settle towards the lowest parts of their body. Since the photos show that more lividity had occurred on Carrie's left arm, they suggested that this arm may have been hanging off the bed, which is contradictory to the way Matt claimed to have found her. The next witness to take the stand was a man who owned a website in Japan. He told the court that his online pharmacy section of his website was accessed by Matt before Carrie's passing and that he placed an order for Ambien, but that he failed to complete the transaction. The case had grown in intensity by this point. There was still no telling what the jury would decide, but the atmosphere in the courtroom was about to get even more intense, as the time had come for Vanessa to take the stand. When asked whether she had lied about having an affair with Matt, Vanessa immediately admitted that she had been untruthful. She then recounted meeting Matt in church one day in 2005. At the time, she was in the process of getting divorced and had been having a difficult time adjusting to life as a single mother. She went to church and was sitting by herself when Matt sat down next to her and they started talking. They would often meet up after that and at times he would talk to Vanessa about Carrie. He explained that she was growing ever more depressed and that she wasn't taking care of their children anymore. Given that he was her minister, Vanessa believed every word and so didn't find it strange that he'd asked her to come to his house for counseling. While praying together, he took hold of her hands and kissed her, which caught her off guard, and she stated that this is when the affair started. He would then often tell her that he wanted Carrie out of his life, and that he had, on several occasions, spoken about ways in which he could end her life without being caught. He considered drugging a milkshake, tampering with her car's brakes, or ending her life in a drive-by. He'd also spoken about making it seem as though she had taken too many sleeping pills. He'd even gone as far as to tell her what date on which he planned to end Carrie's life, the 7th of April, 2006, since this was close to the date that Cassidy had passed away. Committing the act on this date would make it easy for him to claim that Carrie had taken her own life since it was close to the anniversary of Cassidy's passing, and hence would make his claims that she was depressed more believable. Unfortunately, Vanessa kept all of this information to herself rather than reporting it to the police and preventing Matt from claiming the life of his wife in the first place. It's a factor in this case that Linda still struggles to come to terms with, especially since Vanessa had been granted immunity and could not be charged for withholding such information. Vanessa claimed that she chose not to speak up because she was worried that no one would believe her given Matt's position as a minister. She also didn't think that he would do the same thing to her, despite being told by him that she would become his next regret if she didn't keep his secret. In Matt's defense, Gray asked an expert witness about DNA found on the note that was found next to Carrie. He testified that Carrie's DNA was by far the most abundant, which indicated to the defense that she had indeed typed it and printed it out, since she would have handled the paper more than anyone else. Soon enough, the trial was over, and all that was left was for the jury to make their decision. They left the courtroom, and Linda, along with the prosecution, were hopeful that they would return quickly since this is usually a good sign that a guilty verdict had been reached. But over the next seven hours, their hopes started to fade as the jury asked to see Matt's deposition video, a transcript of Vanessa's testimony, and for clarification on whether Matt could only be found guilty of drugging and suffocating Carrie. As the defense had not decided to put Matt on the stand, the jury would have to rely on witness statements and those made by Vanessa, since the prosecution was not allowed to question him in court. Guy James Gray had lost all confidence in his client and was concerned that he would incriminate himself if he were to testify since the prosecution had planned for Matt to reenact his actions that night with the use of a dummy that weighed about the same as Carrie. Had this been done, he would undoubtedly have struggled to demonstrate dressing the dummy while on the phone and his case would likely have fallen apart very quickly. But in the end, this made very little difference, as the jury eventually returned and announced that they had found Matt guilty of taking the life of Carrie Baker. And even then, Matt claimed that they'd made a mistake and that he truly believed in his own innocence. The verdict resulted in Matt being sentenced to 65 years behind bars with the possibility of parole after serving a minimum of 32 years. This man most likely will never leave prison. In the years that have passed since the crime occurred, Linda and the rest of Carrie's family have since forgiven Matt for what he did, since they realized that holding on to a grudge this big 
could only lead to further misery in their lives. Holding on to this level of resentment, it's like punching yourself and hoping someone else gets hurt. At some point, you just have to stop and admit that what is, is. They've made peace with the fact that Carrie's passing could have been prevented by one person who knew of his plans, and the fact that she would ultimately face no consequences for withholding such valuable information. Linda and Jim have now been given custody of Kinsey and Grace, and they continue to live as a loving family in defiance of the heinous acts committed by a man who many people trusted as an advisor, a spiritual guide, and a mentor. This case is another shining example that just because someone claims to be a Christian, a minister of God's word, or any plethora of things, that doesn't necessarily mean they're a good person or that they're even being truthful. A person's true intentions are almost always seen in their actions, not their words. I've said it before, and I feel that it fits here as well, Matt was not a Christian man. Matt was not a man of God. He was a wolf in a sheep's den, and he was out for blood. To him, I say good riddance, and I hope with every fiber of my being that he's able to turn his life around in prison, but I think we all have to admit this is probably a long shot. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below or down in the comments to support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.